OK, great. Uh, so hello. Uh, my name is Alan Jarrett. I'm a developer at Microsoft. I'm one of the maintainers on eBPF for Windows, UBPF, uh, BPF Conformance, and a few other projects. So today's presentation is about a tool we created to validate not only just the BPF ISA, the draft BPF ISA, but also how it allows us to validate other BPF runtimes. Uh, so yeah, quick overview of the agenda here. Introduction, overview of what this is, the reason we created it, how it works, and then time, time for Q&A. So some of this stuff may be known to a lot of folks, but essentially BPF is a synthetic ISA, meaning it doesn't, it's not actually backed by any specific hardware. Uh, it is in the process of being standardized as part of an IETF working group. There are a wide variety of BPF runtimes, the original one being the Linux kernel, but there are also now hardware offloads for BPF, as well as a variety of other uh, BPF implementations. The big challenge here, challenge here is that if we want BPF programs to be portable across platforms, then all of the platforms need to agree upon a specific ISA. Uh, so what the BPF project is, uh, essentially it was designed and written to initially validate the ITF BPF specification. Our thinking there is that we want to make sure that the, essentially the Linux kernel is authoritative, and we want to make sure that the ISA, the draft ISA matches the Linux kernel. The BPF conformance tool gives us a great way to be able to measure the actual behavior of the Linux kernel, as opposed to what, as opposed to just merely examining the source code. The project itself was built reusing test collateral from the UBPF project, with UBPF being a user mode BPF runtime implementation. Uh, it can be used as either a CLI, a standalone CLI, or as a library in another project. And as part of our CI CD, we actually run it against uh, the Linux kernel with the goal there being that the tests should all pass the Linux kernel, implying that the tests are correct. We, we of course, assume that Linux kernel's implementation is authoritative. So any tests that fail then when running against the Linux kernel imply that the test is buggy. So some background on why we're doing the uh, conformance testing here. One of the, as I mentioned, the original goal here was we want to validate the IATF draft specification. Uh, essentially make sure that what's implemented in the Linux BPF runtime matches what the draft spec has, as well as identify gaps in the IETF draft. Interesting enough here, this is one of the areas where we ended up identifying things through this. One of the examples was the behavior of the division operator in BPF. It wasn't super clearly defined what the behavior would be for division by zero, and different BPF runtimes implemented differently. But through this, we were able to identify what it is exactly that the uh, Linux kernel BPF does and define that as part of the spec. Uh, one of the big goals there, of course, is interoperability. We want to be able to make BPF bytecode portable as much as possible. There are certainly some things about the BPF bytecode that are not going to be portable, for instance, dependency on things like kfunks, which is going to be very much platform dependent. But for the ISA itself, we want that to be as portable as possible. Uh, so yeah, the other goal there, of course, is for people who are implementing BPF runtimes, it provides a fairly comprehensive tool to be able to detect whether or not they've implemented the BPF ISA in, or at least the implementation matches what the uh, draft spec has. Uh, longer term, we want to be able to use this for standards compliance. So essentially, we can people can be able to authoritatively say whether or not their BPF runtime does actually match the ITF specification or not. In addition, uh, we also use this for security testing. Specifically, what we use this for here is we verify the prevail verifies behavior against the ISA. This is an interesting use case simply because the prevail verifier has assumptions about what the ISA is supposed to do. And as a result, we can then check based on its assumptions or based on processing a particular sequence of BPF bytecode, it can then reason about what the resultant variables or what the registered values are, and we can compare that against what the expected values are. 
giving us greater confidence that what the prevail verifier is reasoning about is actually the ISO as opposed to just uh, variant thereof. And lastly, this it's a great tool for when we're working on the uh, on the BPF ISO draft, in that we can easily experiment and understand exactly what the behavior of various BPF bytecode sequences are, without having to dig into the Linux BPF runtime, which has complications being BPL and uh, conflicts with other projects some of the people maintainers or some of the authors of the ITF spec are working on. A uh, quick overview of the BPF ISO. It's risk-based. It uses bytecodes in a series of 11 registers. So yes, yeah, so background here. It's originally used for fact processing. Uh, it is now being used for safety and security. Uh, the, the in kernel variant uses the verifier to ensure safety and security of the BPF bytecode, with constraints being there that the bytecode will halt and will not access any memory that has not been directly granted access to. BPF itself was initially used in the Linux or developed in the Linux kernel, but has now been adopted by a wide variety of other platforms as, as we've seen in this, the various presentations the last couple of days. Uh, so here is what we mean by conformance testing and what the approach we've taken. We The test starts by declaring the initial state for the VM. This essentially currently means the context memory being passed to the bytecode. Context memory in this case merely just being a flat array of data, giving an initial state for the BPF program to work on, as well as pre-populating. Well, this is a more of a future one, but we intend to be able to provide the ability to pre-populate maps with specific data to test with. The test then declares a sequence of BPF instructions to execute. We declare them in a GCC style assembly. This was picked over the Clang assembly simply because our view was the GCC style assembly was slightly easier to parse. Not as reasonable as readable as the Clang assembly, but easier to parse. And lastly, the test then declares what the expected return code, or in other words, the, the value of the register R0 will be at the end of the test. A uh, sort of example here would be this is a, uh, yeah, this, this was a particular test that tests the left shift and right shift operators. Uh, as I mentioned, you pretty much, it, it contains the list of assembly instructions followed by the expected result value. The, the way the BPF conformance suite is built is it consists of three things, essentially a runner, which is something that parses the test code, invokes a plugin, and then edits or gathers the data or the results. In this context, a plugin is merely just a, a mechanism, a wrapper around a BPF runtime, so that we can pass it the bytecode in initial state and then get back the result and value. In the case of Linux, the plugin is just merely a fairly small libbpf based program that accepts the BPF bytecode, creates a program in the kernel, loads the bytecode, and executes it. Uh, the tests themselves are, as I mentioned, small snippets of BPF assembly, along with initial value context and expected exit code. Uh, the plugins then are very much runtime specific, with the only exception there being that the goal is we want to sort of meta plugin for libbpf. So any BPF runtime that implements libbpf would, in theory, then be able to share a single runtime. I haven't quite got there yet, but that's one of the sort of goals. One of the challenges we faced here when testing the various runtimes is, apart from libbpf, libbpf a lot of the other BPF runtimes expose different APIs. So ubpf, rbpf all have a different way of invoking and running the uh, BPF runtime. In addition, OSs have a wide variety of IPC mechanisms. So what, what might work for one platform might not work for another. We ended up coming up with the sort of lowest common denominator of IPCs and platform interfaces being the CLI, where we use a, the input and output streams as well as a list of arguments. 
essentially this allows us to stream the BPF code to the input stream. And for the list of arguments, we can pass things like the initial context values and things like that. The BPF conformance runner then interacts with each per runtime uh, plugin by launching the plugin, streaming the data to it, and collecting the, the value of the R0 register from the applet stream. It then, uh, the runner then gathers the data from each of the tests that are run. It, in addition, it will also keep track of what instructions have been tested and what instructions have passed, essentially which, which instructions have been used in tests that pass. This gives a, a fairly easy way to assess which set of instructions this particular runtime has is conformant with. Uh, so one of the interesting things there, of course, is we want to keep the design of the plugin as simple as possible because the plugin is just purely a overhead from this point of view. Uh, we end up creating plugins for a wide variety of platforms. The first one is obviously the for the Linux kernel itself, where we use libbpf to slow the bytecode. In addition, we have plugins for the Prevail Verifier, where in the case of the Prevail Verifier, it doesn't necessarily execute the BPF bytecode, but Prevail essentially then will emulate the bytecode and examine its post conditions. And if its post conditions are sufficiently narrow, it can then evaluate whether or not the post condition for the register R0 matches what the expected value was. Uh, the RBPF, UBPF, and WASM UBPF ones are all fairly similar in that they use a CLI-based approach. The only one that's a little bit different here is the UBPF for Windows one. It in turn actually has a slightly different way of processing BPF bytecode in that it upconverts it from BPF bytecode back to C, compiles it as native executable and executes it. So a couple of things that we are sort of looking for or we're working towards for future enhancements. Today, we pass the raw BPF bytecode to the uh, runtime. We're looking to enhance that so that we can pass the ELF file. The reason for that is uh, it becomes increasingly challenging to pass things like map definitions, as well as cases where we have multiple, multiple local calls in the BPF program. Passing those across as raw BPF bytecodes becomes significantly more complex. Uh, in addition, we would like to end up enhancing our test cases somewhat. We have reasonably good confidence in them, but there's always the possibility we may miss some behavior that we that would be important. As I mentioned, the test cases themselves are all derived from the UBPF runtime, uh, but we've extended it with, I think we've now have covered most of the V3 instruction set, and we're in the process of adding the, the uh, v4 instruction set. Uh, currently, we have a hand rolled assembler that presses the GC style, GCC style assembly. And ideally, if possible, we'd, we'd prefer to just use the real GCC for that. Uh, the last challenge we have here is our daily CI CDs run in GitHub. And GitHub, even its latest runner, has a fairly old Linux kernel. That makes it a little bit challenging. We can't test anything more newer than the CPU v4 instruction set. Uh, uh, so yeah, I figured I'd, this is a fairly short presentation because I figured I'd give leave some time for any questions and see if folks have any additional input or insights or feedback. Hi there. Uh, do we have any kind of timeline for IETF approval? That would actually, I don't actually have a good date, good data on that yet. Uh, there are actually a series of different ITF drafts in progress. The ITF BPF ISA specification itself is the furthest along. Uh, there's a working group processing that right now. Uh, Dr. Thaler is probably the, was, is the person, the contact I know who's working on the most closely, uh, but don't have a good data for when this is gonna be finalized. Thank you.
we have questions if no we can end early okay okay no okay thank you alan thank you for the presentation uh, thank you very much